So platform in game, in game Cube CF. Um, hopefully, um, Cloud Foundry is known here, but uh, even if it isn't, I'd like to explain a bit um, what it is. Uh, Cloud Foundry is a PaaS built for developers. Um, it's all about the CF push experience. If you're familiar with Heroku, powered by build packs. Um, as a developer, um, you shouldn't care how the platform deploys your app. You shouldn't care about the complexities behind. You should be allowed to focus on developing your awesome, awesome app and trust the platform to do the right thing for you. Um, so Cloud Foundry um, is the open source pass. I think it's the largest open source project that has this type of uh, goal. Uh, there are many providers out there that um, have Cloud Foundry distributions, uh, like SUSE, IBM, VMware, and so on. And it's used by half of Fortune 500. Uh, so it, it's, it's a stable project and it's being used worldwide. Um, however, uh, Cloud Foundry on top of Kubernetes is something new. Uh, Historically, uh, Cloud Foundry has been deployed uh, strictly on VMs. And um, for some time now, SUSE has containerized Cloud Foundry um, on top of Kubernetes, uh, building something called SCF, uh, SUSE Cloud Foundry. KubeCF is the next generation uh, project built out of uh, SCF, and it was donated to the Cloud Foundry Foundation this year. Uh, it's meant to take this containerization approach to the next level, uh, make sure that it's as native, as Kubernetes native as possible, and that it's uh, also being contributed on uh, by the entire uh, foundation. Uh, our goal has always been to use certified Cloud Foundry components so that uh, you know every release of kubectl that you get has the right components and you can be sure that they're of the same quality as their um, you know, virtual machine counterparts. Uh, this latest version of, uh, of, of Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes, KubeCF, uh, is actually orchestrated by an operator on top of Kubernetes, which makes it um, so much better. It's easier to manage it, it's easier to build it, it's faster for us maintainers to uh, uh, to to respond to CVs and things like that. So, uh, all all good stuff. Um, so, how does it work? So, um, you install this Cloud Foundry on top of Kubernetes or VMs, and then you push applications. As I mentioned, um, Cloud Foundry uses build packs to essentially build your application and then uh, run it. And um, usually. Cloud Foundry has its own container management system called Diego. It contains a scheduler, it contains uh, um, an engine to, to run containers, uh, manage disks and volumes and so on. Um, and this was uh, the management system for containers used on VMs. But the foundation is also working on Project Irene this is a new component that allows you to swap out Diego in favor of Kubernetes. So you push an application to Cloud Foundry and then Irene will deploy that directly on Kubernetes, skipping Diego altogether. Uh, because uh, as I said, we wanna be certified and make sure that everything is stable, uh, kubectl supports both. So you can either use the older Diego uh, that has been tried uh, for years now, uh, but you can also switch to Irene and the demo that I'm, that we're going to show today uh, is going to show Irene. So push an application and then see, uh, you know, stateful set pop up in, in Kubernetes. Um, yeah, um, so um, just like, you know, Diego is kind of like um, Kubernetes would have been, in a world before Kubernetes was was there and uh, started this container revolution, like so, there's also like Bosch, and Bosch is also like 
it's, it feels strange to talk about it because it's so of the old world, um, of the world of VMs and things. And it's a really complicated tool chain. It actually um, consists of uh, lots of moving parts. There's a CLI to control your cluster. That CLI talks to an agent which has to run on every VM. And that's a very heavyweight agent, uh, the one that partitions the hard disk. Right, and it only runs on, on special operating systems, which are called stem cells. So um, this is like a modified operating system. And it's all very uh, involved and complicated. And it, it works on most of the providers by using like a CPI interface to talk um, to AWS, to talk to OpenStack and such. And um, it, ha it has a lot of the right ideas, but the whole implementation nowadays, when you look at it, it's, it's kind of like a, a different word, right? For example, one of the things I think which is very right about Bosch is that they use a deployment manifest, right? A YAML file, which is descriptive in nature. So they, they, uh, you describe your deployment, which Bosch releases you use. Bosch releases are just like uh, packages, right? For software. So you have to package your software into a Bosch release. And the, the manifest ties it all together and it has templating with embedded Ruby and it puts variables in there and all of that. And um, this is what describes your, your deployment and then you can manage that deployment and you can change it and update it and scale it. And um, that's what Bosch is delivering on VMs. And um, we wanted to take that into containers. And the concepts don't match 100%. So we do a lot of transforming between the both, both worlds, right? The old VM world and the new container world. And um, we, um, we came up with a replacement for the templating, which we do in the containers. Um, we um, generate all the variables as Kubernetes secrets. Or we consume existing Kubernetes secrets. And we can upgrade the cluster in a very fine-tuned way. We got rid of the stem cells and uh, kind of, right? We convert the Bosch releases to Docker images so we can use them. And um, so this is what we do in the operator, like the rendering and managing the deployment. Um, so, um, yeah, I think this is, this is the, um, the actual functionality and how you can show the demo, right? Yep. So I'm going to show a demo now. Uh, it's going to be two parts. First, I'm going to show a recording of uh, a deployment, an installation of kubectl happening on a Google Cloud uh, cluster, so on a GKE cluster. Uh, this is just uh, to, I mean, I shortened 30 minutes into uh, a minute and a half. Uh, just to be able to show the, the installation. And then I'm going to switch to a live demo where we will push an application to, to the cluster that was deployed. Um, so uh, to give you an idea, uh, deploying Cloud Foundry on VMs um, was a, a difficult process. You needed uh, about a dozen VMs, I think, um, dozens of gigabytes of RAM as well. It also took a long time. Um, so uh, it was it was not a, an easy process, but with uh, with kubectl um, you should be able to get started right away. So uh, first we install the operator that we talked about. So we create a namespace, we Helm install it, um, then we just wait for for it to be running. Uh, we see here. Um, Uh, we see here that we, we have uh, two things running as part of the CF operator namespace. We have the operator itself and then another operator for Park's jobs. Uh, we are trying to split off um, uh, some of the components of the operator to make them reusable. Uh, Mario will, will talk about that later. Once this is running, uh, we can actually install kubectl. And that's nothing more than just another uh, Helm install. Uh, the defaults usually work well. So if you want to install on GKE on EKS or AKS or Kind, um, the defaults usually work well. Otherwise, you can alter them to use an ingress instead of load balancers or, or things like that. But um, it's fairly easy, you know, the values YAML file is, is documented, so. Uh, 
uh, we, we all know these uh, these things. So now uh, we did the Helm install, and again, this time is compressed about uh, 30 minutes. It takes about 30 minutes to download all the images to uh, install everything. Uh, the operator, as Mario mentioned, will calculate variables, um, um, create certificates, um, render templates um, for, for control scripts and so on. And then everything starts up and eventually we, we end up with all the components of Cloud Foundry running. Uh, these components provide things like um, the API, right, which the a user uses to push applications and manage organizations and spaces. Um, we have uh, a database uh, to store everything. Uh, we have Irene, which is the conversion piece, uh, which is the glue between Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. Uh, a logging system, messaging system, routing layer, uh, TCP routing layer. UAA is a, is a triple A. Um, um, user management system uh, that's used by Cloud Foundry. So all of these components come together and give you the, the platform. Um, so once this is running, um, we'll see here, I just um, did a get for services, uh, public services. And we have here a few public IPs. I essentially map those out to some DNS names and then Everything's uh, everything's running. Now I'll I'll switch to the live part of the demo. Actually, I want to. Watch pods here. So, actually, let me show you first all the pods in the system. So we have everything kubectl here. Uh, then I've already de uh, deployed uh, an application using Irene. So this is one of those uh, one of those apps. We'll see when I push an application live what happens. We get a, a staging job, and then we get the actual uh, application deployed here, and the operator, of course. So let's watch for Irene namespace. So we have one app there. This is just a simple, a static um, application, just returns hello world. Um, if we look at build packs, we'll see that we should be able to deploy uh, a lot of application types, anything from static files, Java, Ruby, .NET Core, um, Node, Go, Python, etc. So. Uh, platform supports almost anything, but we'll just push something simple to see how, how things look in Kubernetes. So we do CF push. Uh, I'm going to call the app demo, and we're going to use the static file build pack. So just uh, Node.js with some static HTML. So when I push an application, uh, Cloud Foundry will create routes for me. Uh, it will stage the application, meaning it'll look for dependencies. So the build pack will look for dependencies, bundle up uh, um, Nginx uh, for my uh, static site. We can see here that uh, we have a staging job here. So what I was just mentioning is currently happening as a, as a job. Um, and once that is done, Irene will actually uh, push that uh, bundle of an app uh, to, to a blob store, which also acts as, a, as an image registry. Uh, later on, that image registry will serve uh, the image or the container in the pod in the stateful set that's, uh, that's running the app. So just wait here for a bit too long. Hopefully this works. Uh, as it should. Um, we should also be uh, seeing some logs streaming now that uh, that, uh, uh, that that staging pod is, is running. Um, right now, uh, Cloud Foundry is still using uh, the old school routing layer. Um, 
called GoRouter. Um, there is an effort in the Cloud Foundry Foundation to, um, to use Istio instead uh, as a routing layer, both for applications, so for end user apps, as well as uh, connectivity between components. Um, a large part of deploying Cloud Foundry is managing certificates and secrets um, for inter-component communication and Istio can, can definitely help there. So container is still creating, give it maybe one more minute. It might be downloading a base or something. What, what I find so fascinating is that the Bosch um, stuff I talked about earlier, that's just for installing Cloud Foundry. And then Cloud Foundry, when it installs an app, that's a completely different flow what you see here. Um, yeah. yeah, sometimes the downloading of the image from the, uh, from the image registry can be a bit slow. Um, I hope this will finish. Um, yeah, so it's running now. We should be seeing some Ah, okay, that's why connection to my uh, jump box. Uh, my, I got disconnected from my jump box. Uh, that's why we weren't seeing any logs. Uh, so we should actually, yeah. So this is everything that we were missing. I thought it was stuck, but it actually wasn't. Uh, my apologies. Uh, so we should have been seeing this. It was um, Cloud Foundry's built uh, study file build back, um, setting up Nginx for, for, our, um, for our app. Now I can just uh, curl. Uh, I can just curl this um, demo app that we have here. And we get Hello World. So this concludes this, uh, this part of the presentation, the demo. So I'll go back to presentation. Uh, as I was saying, uh, the foundation is working on making these components more native. So as Mario mentioned, uh, we're now sort of converting all that Bosch information and deploying things on Kubernetes. But um, for example, Irene has a native Helm chart. Uh, we are working now to include UAA as a native uh, as a native component, so not convert pieces. Uh, also working on integration with other uh, Q projects like Istio. Uh, there's uh, there are efforts to support better logging and metrics using Prometheus. So all of the all of the tools that are at our at our disposal in the uh, Kubernetes community, we want to take advantage of those. And of course, cloud native buildbacks. Uh, if you're familiar with buildbacks.io, um, the foundation is also working on making the cloud controller work with, uh, with cloud native buildbacks. So all of the buildbacks that are shown uh, now, but built specifically for Kubernetes, uh, which you know, makes it easier to, to create images and so on. So this this whole experience will be faster. Uh, yeah. yeah, so um, a large part of our operator concerns itself with um, converting the old world into the new one. And it's rather slow and involved because we have to pass and understand all the YAML, the Bosch releases uh, also, they also bring their own manifests. And um, so the, a lot of the work is like very Bosch specific and will hopefully go away as components become more native and uh, deployment becomes faster. But um, we structured the project in a way that we think we can sal salvage some of the work. And so we came up with some, I think, three core components which we want to reuse. And the one you already saw, it's already, uh, standalone hand chart, which uh, you could use. 
uh, which is Quark's job. And it's basically a wrapper about around a Kubernetes job. It acts as a template, so you can trigger it. You can tell it to run now and it will spawn a new Kubernetes job. Well, and it can also do other stuff like um, persist the output of the job in a secret um, or um, run again if one of the inputs to the job changes. So if the job is mounting a secret and that changes, it could rerun the job and generate a new secret for you, for example. And um, these secrets can be versioned. We didn't put this into an explicit component, but we have something concept in the operator, which is called version secret. And these are just secrets which have a version appended to the name. And we have a validation webhook to enforce that they are not changed. So you have item potent secrets and Quark's job supports them. We also have another component, which we call Quark secret. And that just generates um, Kubernetes secrets for you. Um, for example, SSH keys or um, SSL certificates or cluster um, signed CA certificates and um, passwords, of course. So when we work through the manifest and um, some application needs a password, you don't have to feed it from the outside. You can generate it in cluster and you get a Kubernetes secret out of it. And I think one of the most involved components is the Quark stateful set which is a wrapper around Kubernetes stateful sets, of course, and it supports uh, different um, things which are well known in the Bosch world, right? Bosch brings, of course, its own concept of networking and deployment strategies and all such things, uh, lifecycle management tools. Um, we try to emulate some of them in Quark stateful set. And one is canary deployments, where we um, like the canary on the mine, right? We just start one instance of the replica count and we see if that instance works and if it works, we start up the other ones. Now we have zero downtime deployments. Um, uh, we have um, support for Kubernetes uh, zones, like availability, availability zones, right? And um, just by using the existing ones, right? Um, we have um, active passive support by implementing probes for that. So um, when one of the instances uh, replies positively to the probe, it can become the active one and the other ones switch to passive. So these are the um, extensions we have there and uh, we plan to make them uh, into standalone components to see if they are useful. Yeah, I guess um, that's it. If you are interested in the project, our main operator is the first URL, the CF operator still in the incubation of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, right? And the, the project which, which ties it all together and which actually um, brings Cloud Foundry to your Kubernetes, that's kubectl. So um, if you want to talk to us, we are on Slack. There's the kubectl channel for everything which relates to the Cloud Foundry application runtime and the Quark's dev channel for um, the research we do to, uh, well, keep Cloud Foundry or make Cloud Foundry even more Kube native. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. If, if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad and Mario. Yeah, I was looking for questions, but it doesn't seem to be any. But it's an interesting project. I mean, it's a, it's a popular project called Foundry used by a lot of companies out there and now as a new home in Kubernetes, which is nice and inclusive. I like it. Yeah. We don't think they compete too much. I think uh, they can, they can live together very well. Yeah, it's a, it's a new home for, for those workloads that used to live so well in, uh, in Cloud Foundry. Now, now can have, yeah. uh, they can be first class citizens in Kubernetes world. 